Hello and welcome back to this installment. We're on part two of the explicit solution for the coefficients to the three parameter change point model. If you haven't seen the first video, I encourage you to go ahead and review that. And by the end of this video, I hope we are going to get through to solving for all the coefficients for this model here, the hockey, sh hockey stick shape model. In the last video, I laid out some of the groundwork for this and to remind everybody, what we are looking to solve for are what are these three values? Beta naught, this constant height, beta two, the x value of the, what is known as a change point, and beta one, which is the slope of this portion in the higher x region. Now again, normally we're, for me, I, we're making these four things that relate outdoor air temperature to the whole building energy use. But again, we're going to be, in an abstract sense, above this, we're just going to be talking about uh, your typical x's and your typical y's. So as I described in the last video, the way we typically go about figuring out what values we should have for these coefficients is we minimize a loss function or an error function. And for typical linear regression, that function is the sum of squared errors because it has lots of nice calculus properties as we'll, we'll come to see. And so let's go ahead and just, let's write out that sum of squared errors equation. So if I talk about what is the sum of squared errors, it's pretty much exactly what it's stating. So each one of these data points, we have n data points, has some sort of some sort of error. And we can go ahead and we can write that. So if I if I say these are all x, y pairs, and we so x1, y1, x2, y2, you know, this is x1, y1, this is x2, y2, we can go ahead and we can write this out. So if I want to know the difference, I'm going to start by with point one and we can just start by what we measured so we'll say y1 and the difference we'll have to take a subtraction is what our model predicted so our model is the constant term plus the slope term plus this weird nomenclature we'll say x1 minus beta 2 and with this plus and I have explained that in a couple other videos, what that means, and then we will square that. So that all relates to one of these terms, the x1, y1 pair. And that's just one of the n of them. So if we want to continue on, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to add it to y2, and I will just quickly write this out. x2 minus beta2 because at this point we don't know exactly, I, I wrote this as this, this was one, this is two, but you could get this data in any order. And so this could actually be our x3, y3. And so we don't necessarily know right now at this point who is on this side and who is on the left side. And this process continues for all n data points. And now normally, so what we want to do is we want to have the lowest value for this. We want to minimize this function. And to remind you that this sum of squared errors function, this has got three inputs. You give me a, a beta 1, beta naught, and beta 2, and I can give you out what the resulting sum of squared errors is. These are the three inputs. This is the output. And if you remember from calculus, if we want to minimize this function, we need to take the derivative of this function with respect to all three of these different variables, so it'll be partial differentiation. We need to set all of those equal to zero. We'll have three equations, three unknowns being beta naught, beta one, and beta two. And once again, we solve that system of equations and we're good to go. There's only one problem though, as I explained in the last video. This, this syntax here, and this right here, this form of, of function is not differentiable at that point. There's, is, is, it, is the slope zero or has it got the slope of beta one at this point? It's, it's not really 
something you can figure out. And so that causes a lot of problems. And so the big insight into solving this, this problem that we're, we're having is that we're going to just decide to arbitrarily, for now, solve the simpler problem. So what I want to do is I want to say, okay, instead of having all of this data in some random order, I'm going to order it by the x value. So I'm going to say that x1 is less than or equal to x2, less than or equal to x3, so on, so on. And I'm going to introduce some new nomenclature and I'm going to say x of L and x of M and then we have some more all the way into our last x which we'll call x of N. And I'm going to use L and M as indices to represent given some arbitrary split. So I'm just going to split it I'll split it where this will naturally end up being but it could be anywhere. We're going to choose all of these at, at one point. This here would be x of L, this will be x of M, and instead of saying this is x3, y3, this last one is x of N. And this is over here still at x of 1. So if I say this is x of L, this is x of M, this is x of N. So we put all those in order. And we are just going to arbitrarily say that we are going to have a change point between two of these x values. And we're just going to operate under that assumption and see where that takes us. So now we can take this original sum of squared errors function and we can do some modifications. So let's go ahead and let's let's do those modifications now. So this is our you know our arbitrary arbitrary remember I'm an engineering major not an English major arbitrary split somewhere where the split is between this x of L term and the x of M term. So we'll start sum of squared errors. We'll start over here. We'll start from the left hand side to the right hand side. So our first term again we are going to have the corresponding y value y1 minus what the model says. Well what's nice now is that for these beginning ones we don't really need, it doesn't really matter what this beta 2 term or the beta 1 term is. All that matters is the model really is just this constant term. So if I want to know the error between this point and the line, I just need to know the y value for that point and beta naught. So this really simplifies these first terms down to this. And we always have to square because we're doing sum of squared errors. We don't really care whether that error was positive or negative. We kind of want to do it in a aggregate sense here absolute sense. So that is for our data point one. And we could do this for data point two. And you will repeat that process for all of the data points up until our arbitrary split. So all the way from index one to index L. Now let's deal with the points after the split. So the first one of those will be Y sub M and let's subtract out the model. Uh, I'm going to distribute, instead of writing it like this form, I'm going to distribute this negative sign. So we have minus beta naught, minus beta one, x of m, minus beta two. And again, now we don't need this plus, this plus sign, which is representing basically, don't give me a negative value back. This is the ramp function. This is it. We know that this is going to be here and it's going to be a positive value, guaranteed because of the way we've arbitrarily set this, this up. So we, and we go to square this, and we continue on all the way until y sub n minus beta naught minus beta one, x sub n minus beta two, and we will square that whole term. So now we have a sum of squared errors function. Again, a function of beta naught, beta one, and beta two, but this is now continuous and that allows us to now use some calculus so let's go ahead and do that that calculus so we need three things we are going to need the partial derivative of that with respect to beta naught equal to zero we're going to need it with respect to beta one and we're going to need it with 
respect to beta 2. So now here's some fun practice in calculus. People say, "May when are you going to use the calculus? Well, I used it right here. So if we want to take the partial derivative of this with respect to beta naught, let's do that first. So let's say, let's say this equal to zero, which is also equal to, we're going to have n of these terms here that are squared. So each one of them we're going to handle separately because if you remember calculus, you can kind of split up these derivatives for each each term that's being added together. So let's focus on this one to start. So we have a function and it's squared. So uh, by the power rule, we got to bring down the two into the front. And now we have the inside term as is. And we need to now multiply this chain rule by the derivative of what's inside here and derivative with respect to beta naught. Well, that term does nothing for us, the y term, and we have a negative sign. So really, the product rule says we got to multiply this whole thing by negative one. I'm going to put the negative sign out here. And we're done with that term. So let's move on to the next one. It's going to be exactly the same, except now again, we would add, but there's going to be this minus sign y2 minus beta naught and so on and so forth for all those terms on the left hand side of the change point and now let's do it on this side so again we have power rules so the two comes in front and we have the entire inside as it stood before x sub m minus beta 2 and we got to now multiply by the derivative of this thing with respect to beta naught well this gives us nothing. This term has no beta naught. So really, again, all we have is this minus beta naught. So all we have to do is add a negative to the front here. And we won't do it for all n terms because that could take a while. But we have basically the basic form of this. So we have all these terms on the left hand side, all these terms on the right hand side. Now, what you'll notice is each one of these is going to have a minus 2 associated with it and we have this quality to zero, so I can really eliminate the two here. The two can just disappear, and it will not really change our, our results. So, just gonna kinda imagine this negative two disappearing. What I'd also like to do now is simplify this. Instead of having this, uh, this infinite series of dots and lots and lots of terms, I want to bring these into new variables, and two new variables we're going to need is we're going to need to understand what is the count of the data on this side and the count on the data of this side. So there is a total of n points. What I decided in this paper to use as my nomenclature was there was going to be some number of points on the left hand side and some points on the right hand side. And I used less than and greater than signs to, to indicate that. So there's n less than the change point and n greater than the change point. So with those in mind, let's go down here. And so we're going to cancel all these out. And let's start combining things together. So let's focus now first on all these y terms. So if I expanded all this out, we would have a y1 here, y2, y3, all the way to yn. And so I can really write that more succinctly as the sum as I from one, I started from one as though, though it kills me as a computer scientist and a software engineer that we usually start our loops with zero, but I thought it would be better for the general public to start with one. Um, again, you could do it however you feel like. This goes, oh, and we're going to n, and this is the sum of the y sub i's. So, we have really now taken care of uh, that term, that term, bunch of terms in here, y sub m all the way to y sub n. So we have that. Now let's focus on these beta naught terms. Okay? So we have a minus beta naught here, we have a second minus beta naught here, a third one here. Well, how many beta naughts would we have? Well, that's pretty straightforward. We'll have n beta naughts because it's part of every term, whether it was on the, the below change point terms or the above change point terms, so we have that. 
let's do the these terms will get multiplied out so there's really two terms here we'll start with these pairings so for these lower terms well, we won't have anything related to those so it's only going to be n greater than sign related so we have minus beta 1 x m minus beta 1 x m plus 1 so on and so I hope you can make this jump you will have beta 1 for all of them so you can pull that out and you'll be multiplying by the sum from i equals not 1 but from m to n of all of these x's and for this term we have a negative beta 1 negative beta 2 that becomes a positive beta 1 beta 2 and you are going to have n greater than sign of those and again that all equals zero so we took the derivative of this, of this kind of massaged sum of squared errors with respect to beta naught and we did that we set it equal to zero and now we have this very nice formula with one two three four terms and again these you know your data so you know you can always calculate out this sum of the y's and the sum of the x's in a certain portion or a certain subset again the function is it's a function of beta naught beta one and beta two okay so we've done that for beta naught let's go ahead and go to beta one so let's go ahead and do that quick so we have the sum sum of squared errors beta 1 equals to 0 so I'm gonna kinda have to be moving back and forth up here beta 1 these will actually get a little easier now there are no beta 1 items in these first 1 through L terms so really that is all 0 that derivative is 0 those are all constants with respect to B1 so really we only have to look over here so we'll have to do again We'll bring down the two in the front, have the whole interior, beta one, x sub m, minus beta two. And now we gotta multiply by the derivative of this with respect to beta one. So the only term that'll have it will be this, this beta one times the x sub m and with respect to beta 1 you can imagine this as a constant so we have to multiply for the product rule by x sub m minus beta 2 and we do this all the way for all of the n terms so uh, I'll just I'll do this quick so we can multiply this by 2 y sub n minus beta naught beta 1 x sub n minus beta 2 all x sub n minus beta 2 it's getting a little messy apologize for that and that has another parenthesis okay so we have all of this and this is going to get a little more messy a little more term a few more terms than this one which had four Again, there's a two for all of these, so we'll just ax the two out. We don't need the two. Divide by two everywhere. And so we're gonna have, again, this expands out to two terms. So we have one, two, three, four. And we got another two here. So really, you're gonna double that. We're gonna have really eight terms that we need to kind of boil down into a smaller thing. So let's start with the y terms we'll start with the y multiplied this term multiplied by uh, this term okay so really we'll have for the first term we'll have ym times xm the next one will be y x y m plus one times m x plus one and so on and so this will equal the sum from i is equal to m to n of x sub i y sub i so that's our our first one now let's do y our y's multiplied by our beta twos here and so that's got a minus sign so we will have a beta two for everybody 
and we are going to multiply that by I equals m2n of, of y. So we have two of those terms. Let's focus on the the beta naughts times these two, so we will have minus beta naught, and we will have the sum of these, i equals m to n of x sub i. <coughs> and now we'll have minus beta naught minus beta two, so that becomes a positive beta naught beta two. And we will have a certain number of those. We will have n greater sign of those, so that takes care of really these two terms and their corresponding partner here. So I hope you're getting a, a kind of a general sense of how this is going. So now we'll take this term, so we'll have beta one, x of m, and another x of m. So we'll have these squared now. So we have minus beta one pulled out, and we are going to have a sum from i equals m to n of x of i squared. So let me make sure that you are summing the squares of these i terms greater than our arbitrarily chosen change point. So we have that. Let's do it with beta two. So now we have a beta one, a beta two, and these x's. So we have, this is minus minus, so that's a plus. So plus beta one, beta two, sum i equals m to n of x sub i. So we have two terms that are left. We have this beta one, beta two, x sub m, which will actually be the same as this, right? So this is positive. And so really we'll actually have two of these guys. We're gonna put a two sign, remember? Beta one, beta two, x sub m, that will all correspond exactly to what we did before, which was uh, this term, this term, that term. And the last one is beta one, beta two, and another beta two. So we have to, we, and let's just get our signs straight here. We have a negative, negative, negative. So that will be another negative. And we have beta one, and we have beta two squared, and we'll have n greater of those. Okay, I think I got all my signs right. You can double check me if you'd like. I think in the paper I, I then multiply this all by negative one and rearrange. Some of these terms are in the same order, but you can do that. That uh, doesn't hurt anything. So this is by far, and this, remember, is all equal to zero. This was the most complicated of the equations. But again, it's just a, these, these fancy sums are actually fairly easy to compute and some of them are the same here, so we only have to compute this once, and we can reuse that in all of these other equations. They basically boil down to numbers. So again, the only things that are unknowns here are beta naught, beta one, and beta two. So let's go ahead and let's do the uh, derivative of the sum of squared errors function with respect to our final thing, beta two. If I come up here, this is what we're differentiating. Again, these first terms aren't going to even be a part of this. So all we have to remember is this. So I'm gonna explain it up here and then we'll move down and write, write it there. We're gonna move the two to the front. We're gonna have all of this stuff here and we have to take the derivative of what's inside here. And so our only term will be related to this beta two and if you can imagine in your head, if we would have expanded this out, we would have a positive beta one, beta two. And so really the, the, the added thing here is just gonna be an extra beta one multiplied from the chain rule. So let's go ahead and write that down. So we have two times, again, we're starting with the mth term, the first term after the change point. So we have y sub m minus beta naught minus beta one, x sub m minus beta two, and we need to multiply that by positive beta one, because remember this positive and this positive, we would have had a positive b1, b2 term, and with respect to b2, this b1 beta one is a constant. And we'll do that, and we have that all the way until the, the mth 
terms. So this is going to be a little simpler again because now this multiplication here is only going to add, it's not going to double the amount of terms. So we're only going to have four terms again here. So what do we have? Again, all these twos would cancel out. If there was a two over here, we will have all of the we will have, let's start with the y, so y, m, and beta 1. So we will have positive beta 1 times the sum of i equals m to n of the y's. That's the first term. We'll have beta naught beta 1. We will have n greater th than the change point of those. We'll have beta 1 beta 1 x x's so negative sign minus beta 1 squared sum i equals m to n of x of i's and last term we have beta 1 beta 1 and a beta 2 coming along and that's going to be a positive beta 1 squared times beta 2 and we have a certain number of those and again, that's all equal to zero. And now for the big reveal. So we have three equations, which I have here. The, all the partial derivatives set to zero, and they're all continuous. And we can solve this set of three equations, three unknowns for our three coefficients. And that will be the location of a critical point, not necessarily the minimum, I can't guarantee that at this point, I'll go into why I know this will eventually be the minimum, or at least one of the solutions will be the minimum in a future video, but to this point I just want to show what the solutions are for this. So how would you go about this? Well, one thing to notice is that, is this linear? No, not really, because we have different coefficients being multiplied by each other. It's also quadratic in the sense that these beta, some of them have, uh, they're squared. And so what we're end, gonna end up having is we're gonna have two solutions to this. And to be honest, uh, this is the point where I didn't do this by hand. I went to a tool, Mathematica, and I let that do the dirty work of solving this for me and then I analyze the results after it. So the real insight here was to make this problem simpler and make this continuous and try to solve that problem. That's something a computer wouldn't necessarily think to do, but a computer is great at just churning some of the, the more difficult mathematical gymnastics that needs to happen to, to make this accomplished. So, went to Mathematica, again, three equations, three unknowns, and we can get some solutions, which I am just going to write down, and uh, you'll see them in a second. So instead of writing that all by hand and being messy about it, I'm going to just actually show you the results from the paper. I use the same nomenclature. So if you are following through with the actual paper here, I was doing some of that same math. You'll notice these familiar items here. And then I say to find the critical or stable points, we got to set all those equal to zero and solve these equations, and we get two solutions. And the first solution actually is not useful. So here we have a beta naught of the sum of the y's divided by the number of data points. Well, actually, that turns out to be just the average of the y values. And we have beta 1 equals to zero, which is strange and actually is not a great solution for us. And then this beta 2 term, which is our change point value, is this kind of convoluted uh, mess of terms. But this is really not useful. This is a solution in which the slope coefficient is zero. And so this is not really, and I really haven't looked into what this solution is. Uh, it is a critical or a stable point, or a saddle point, uh, really. And so we don't really know what's happening here. But I know that this is not the solution we were looking for. We don't ever expect this slope coefficient to be zero. Again, that is saying that this portion here is actually flat and that really we just have a flat line. And so that's not what we were looking for. But we now have another solution. 
So, beta naught is the sum of the y's in total minus the sum of the y's high divided by n minus n greater. And what this turns out to be is this beta naught, the constant term in the best situation is the average of the values below the change point. So what we're saying is the best line you can fit over on this portion is really the average height of all these data points. And that was really a cool and really makes sense type of result. So I was very pleased with how that turned out. Our slope term is some mess of these nonlinear combinations of X and Y's. And the change point ends up being this pretty gnarly fraction, but we can break it down. It's not too hard. We have a numerator and a denominator. And where I define it, the numerator is this string of terms and the denominator is this here but this has a real solution and this will give you a real value and if you use rational numbers you get perfect arithmetic here in the sense that there are, there's no problems with with rounding or uh, scale you have these values you plug them in you get out the coefficients that will result in the critical point, which we'll see in a later video, will actually correspond to the minimum sum of squared errors and is the model you want for that particular case. Now again, this was all hinging on the fact that we just arbitrarily chose a split. And we he said, if you have this, this form of the sum of squared errors, what would the potential place for a minimum be? So we really haven't found the, the real true beta naught, beta one, beta two you want to use because we've only tried one case. And so we'll have to try all the cases. So if you have 12 points, so there's 11 different splits. And actually you won't have to test one of the endpoints, so it'll be 10 of them you'll have to test. Um, but we'll get into that in the next portion of the video. I've already gone far longer than I normally do, but I felt that it was good to keep continuity with this one. So for those of you who have made it this entire way of this algebra journey, I. I applaud you and I hope that you have a much better understanding of how this math and how this came about. So I thank you guys again. Please like, share, and subscribe. See you in the uh, next videos.